Welcome. This is a new seminar series that we're starting. It's a collaboration between the Institute for Foundations of Machine Learning, IFML, and the UT Good Systems Initiative. Both of our programs are very interested in issues surrounding uh, ethics in AI. And so we've started a new seminar series. This semester's focus is going to be on primarily on fairness in machine learning and we're excited to have talks that can possibly spark some new research collaborations among all the researchers here. We're super excited to have the first talk being given by Jamie Morgenstern, who's a professor at the University of Washington in the computer science department. She got her PhD at Carnegie Mellon University, and then I think she's a postdoc at Penn, and then a professor at Georgia Tech um, and then UW stole her away from Georgia Tech, uh, so that's where she is now. She's really well known for working at the intersection of algorithms, uh, machine learning, and game theory, and is also an expert and has done great work on privacy. Um, she just received an NSF Career Award, so congratulations to her for that. <laughs> and it was announced here first. <laughs> it was announced here first, and uh, so, uh, take it away, Jamie. We're, we're really excited to have you. Thanks for being here. Fantastic. And let's see if, uh, screen sharing will work for me today. Uh, uh, thank you so much for that very nice introduction. Okay. Okay, good. Maybe no. Okay, one second. As I said, I'm teaching, well, I'm teaching three days a week, and it doesn't seem to matter how many times you teach, every time seems to have some new. Yeah, I think as a, have as some a, new. for the assistant professors out there, a professional tip is to uh, try to only teach twice a week. That's my, that's my tip for you. I understand. Uh, <laughs> definitely good hot tip. Uh, I'm teaching, I'm teaching, uh, of the second year class. Uh, and I was sort of surprised when it was announced the time of my class and I'd never been asked. Uh, so this one particular, yeah, if, if a class is low level enough, you get like no say in when it's scheduled. Right. <laughs> so. I, I should also say that Jamie is a core member of our IFML team. And, and <laughs> I see she's doing, this is some joint work with Se Wung Oh, who's also at UW and he's also an IFML team member. Yep, yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you again for that really excellent introduction. Um, and I'll note that I planned this talk with the idea that it would be more fun if it were interactive, uh, as opposed to me just talking at a, at a blank screen for an hour. So please stop, interrupt me, ask questions. Uh, there are a couple of points where I've maybe somewhat obliquely asked uh, that people provide some, some feedback, some input. Uh, and you know, I'll I'll stop somewhat awkwardly and wait for thirty seconds. If nobody says anything, then I'll uh, fill it in myself. But I, I definitely prefer that this be more interactive. Um, yeah. So today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, a few recent and still ongoing projects. Uh, and I, I likely actually won't have time uh, to talk about this middle project. Uh, However, uh, each of these projects uh, involves a lot of excellent people and uh, is aiming to try to understand when and why we repeatedly have been seeing that uh, machine learning systems don't have equally good performance uh, on, on different populations. Okay? Uh, and taking sort of an algorithmic and statistical approach to understanding why precisely that might happen. So uh, to start, right, there's a lot of evidence in a lot of different uh, domains uh, that machine learning systems, uh, either models or just the data that we've collected, uh, have resulted in predictions that have uh, different performance uh, for different populations. Right? Um, and this has been evident in sort of any domain you might imagine. right? Uh, from healthcare to uh, to vision systems um, to recommendation systems, um, pretty much anywhere you can look and have a data set for which you have some demographic information, 
unsurprisingly, you, we've seen evidence that there's a correlation between uh, any demographic you look at uh, and the predictions that are made by machine learning systems, right? Um, and there's been a lot of uh, questioning as to why this might happen, right? Um, there's some thought that this might be inevitable due to differences in our in the different demographic statistics, right? Uh, and indeed, right, the reason we're seeing differences in performance, or one of the reasons uh, we're seeing differences in performance, is uh, that the set of features and the prediction tasks we're looking at do have some correlation uh, to do, to to uh, the demographic uh, of different individuals, right? Um, but just because there is some difference in the statistical properties of different demographics doesn't necessarily mean this behavior is inevitable, right? Um, there are lots of choices, both sort of externally visible and sort of tacit that we as machine learning engineers make uh, while we are designing machine learning models and systems um, that can also impact this, perhaps exacerbate uh, existing statistical differences. Um, and one of the sort of points that gets the most visible uh, notice, both by technical and non-technical folks, uh, is, is the idea that perhaps this is just the result uh, of the fact that our data sets are definitely going to have less data about smaller populations, right? Um, and most, if not all of the folks on this call are probably aware that, you know, smaller data set size yield worse generalization uh, and there's sort of an information theoretic uh, consequence of belonging to a smaller population, being that we will have sort of less confidence about our predictions that we make about it, right? Um, but all of these things uh, are some, so are, are, are pieces of the puzzle to understanding why machine learning systems uh, have different uh, properties and predictions for different populations, okay? Um, so the large scale uh, endeavor that I am undertaking, uh, along with many, uh, many members who are affiliated with ISML, uh, is to understand when and why machine learning algorithms treat these groups differently, uh, and when can we use tools from you know, many of the spaces and foundations of machine learning to make them robust to moderate, moderate demographic differences. Right? Um, and sort of as a, you know, a sub question, uh, it's very interesting to think about how much of machine learning's disparate impact is the consequence of machine learning engineers' choices. Right? Um, be they sort of choices we normally think about and reason about formally, or those that are sort of more tacitly pushed aside as sort of outside of the general framework that we think of when we think of machine learning. So I do want to, uh, you know, perhaps make this brief. Uh, you know, this is this is a good place to maybe mention that lots of people often ask uh, sometime about now when I talk about uh, machine learning uh, and the equitable or inequitable predictions that these systems uh, generate. Uh, they often it's often asked, isn't this just a policy question? Isn't it the case that we should just rely on you know either legal or legislative or sort of like on high some administrative body to tell us what properties do you want these systems to have give us a constraint we will satisfy that constraint right or show that it's impossible to satisfy right uh and i want to push back against that perspective for a bunch of different reasons um but the most effective way to ensure these systems work well uh is to consider uh diversity and equity throughout the pipeline and throughout the design of the system, not just sort of as a constraint at the last possible moment before a system or a model is deployed, right? Um, so I think it's very important that we assess uh, each part of the machine learning pipeline as we develop it uh, and think about sort of which of our choices uh, might make that last, you know, the last inch of that mile uh, more difficult to satisfy. Okay. Uh, and just a reminder, right? Uh, I won't uh, be talking about this in any great uh, level of detail today, but um, 
not all mistakes are created equal, right? If we're talking about differences in performance, uh, I'm largely going to avoid talking about uh, which differences in performance uh, I care about today, right? Um, but, you know, it, it might be the case that you are familiar with some of the work in the, in the space of fairness and machine learning, and you might understand there are many different metrics that are often used and considered when thinking about, uh, thinking about fairness, right? Um, and I'm not going to belabor the differences between sort of asking that we equalize the rate at which we label different demographics a certain thing or the rate at which we have accuracy, uh, you know, the, the guarantees on accuracy we have for the different populations or, uh, or any of these things. Uh, but it is worth mentioning that, you know, a false positive is not necessarily equally problematic as a false negative, right? So uh, erroneously labeling someone as uncreditworthy uh, might have substantially larger consequences societally than uh, giving a loan to someone who might not, uh, who might be borderline. So uh, it's just important that we think about these, uh, these decisions we're making uh, in a very contextual way when we're thinking about precisely, uh, you know, computer scientists love to abstract right and uh it, it has it has led us to think of you know some really elegant and beautiful machinery for solving problems in the world uh and that's often quite reusable uh but specifically in the context of thinking about machine learning systems that operate and make predictions about people uh it's often important to uh remove some of the layers of abstraction and think very concretely about sort of the consequences uh of choices in one way or another Okay, so I continue to belabor uh, this idea that, you know, most of the work uh, that many people in sort of CS, uh, CS departments uh, consider to be machine learning is this last piece, right? Um, you know, sort of the, the majority of, of the perspective within a computer science department, not necessarily within the machine learning group, Department, but within a machine uh, within a computer science department, is that machine learning experts think about hypothesis classes, training algorithms, objective methods, constraints, right? Uh, and that this is most of most of the real technical work that they do, right? Um, and maybe occasionally a little bit sort of further behind that on the front line, right? Um, you know, thinking about data gathering processes, uh, measurement of feature selection. Sorry about that. Okay, so, um, right. So I think it's important that we sort of broaden our perspective and think about, um, and, and much of recent machine learning is doing this, right? So uh, this is not necessarily specific to, to fairness, uh, but it is a broader perspective than maybe like a global computer scientist might have uh, of machine learning, that it's not the right perspective to think about machine learning as sort of this black box at the very end of the process where we're given a data set and we produce a model, right? Uh, how the data set is gathered and sort of what properties it, have, it, it has, uh, should be informed by sort of the choices we're going to make downstream, right? It shouldn't just be that sort of we make this choice and then we go here and then we go here, right? We should be thinking about as our data, as we are doing, uh, as we are gathering data and as we are, you know, making choices about measurements and feature selection, um, we should be thinking about the hypothesis classes and training algorithms we're using and using, uh, using those to inform upstream as well. Right. Uh, and this is just sort of a, a, a graphic that I, I like to, to use, right? Uh, this sort of batch uh, machine learning algorithm where like the only interesting thing that happens is right here, uh, ignores a lot of important aspects uh, of machine learning that are specifically very important uh, in the context of thinking about disparate predictions. Okay. So the remainder of my talk, I'm going to sort of uh, draw some distinctions which are often uh, 
not made as clear, I think, uh, in slightly less technical talks on, on fairness. Um, and I want to uh, draw distinctions in particular between what I call data imbalance and data scarcity. Um, and so I want to start by thinking about data uh, or in fact, our, our underlying distribution that we care about our performance on, um, you know, it might be, it, it's a, a simplifying model, but one that I think is often fairly enlightening to think about the distribution on which we care to operate as a mixture between two different distributions, right? Um, so you can imagine this as, you know, one, dem one demographic has uh, distribution D1 and the other demographic has distribution D2, and we are uh, you know, the, the data we're actually observing uh, is being drawn uh, according to a mixture between those two dis different distributions, right? Um, and this is obviously a simplification, uh, but it's, I think, a useful one for thinking about a number of different things in the space of fairness and machine learning. Okay, so what do I mean when I say that data imbalance is one of the sources of possible uh, inequitable predictions in machine learning. So again, let's think about this, uh, this mixture model. Um, and the main, uh, the main uh, thing I want to capture when I say data imbalance is the idea that the distribution from which we are getting samples may not be equal to the test distribution. Um, and this is something which people are very familiar with uh, when not thinking about fairness, right? And it has nothing uh, inherently to do with this mixture model, right? Um, but when our training distribution and our test distribution fail to match, right, there are all sorts of things that go wrong. Um, but in the context of thinking about this mixture model and thinking about this as two different populations, uh, I want to sort of draw out two specific sub cases of where our sampling distribution and test distribution might not match uh, that might lead to particular problems when thinking about fairness and machine learning. The first of which uh, I want to think about is class imbalance, right? Um, so if the rate at which our sampling distribution generates samples from D1 uh, is different than the rate at which sort of the, the test distribution generates uh, points from D1, right? Namely that alpha and alpha hat, right? The rate at which samples come from D1 is different than the rate at which uh, our global distribution generates samples from D1, right? That's going to be problematic for a bunch of reasons, right? Um, and, and will cause all sorts of problems downstream. Um, and as sort of a, a subset or, or a, a further, a further, uh, uh, a further clarification of that, right? Another case in which uh, uh, sampling distribution not being not matching the test distribution can be problematic uh, is when you know maybe it's the case that uh, the rate at which we're getting samples from D1 and D2 uh, in train and test are the same. Uh, however. Uh, it might be the case that the rate at which we're getting positive examples from one of the populations mismatches or negative examples from one of the populations is a mismatch between train and test, right? And there's a lot of evidence that both of these uh, occur in certain scenarios and they can be really problematic, right? So if we only have examples of, of, of women who fail to repay uh, mortgages, right? even if the rate at which we have examples of women and men is roughly proportional to the global statistics that we care about, right? Um, if we have many more negative examples, namely examples where women fail to repay the loan uh, that are then is true globally, right? That's going to have all sorts of implications downstream. Okay. So uh, data Jamie, imbalance. Why don't, yep. why don't I just, why don't I just reweight the, the, you know, the samples appropriately, if I can estimate alpha and alpha hat. Yeah, yeah. If we know alpha and alpha hat, that is a reasonable thing to do, which will which will uh, fix data imbalance to, to a great extent, for sure. Um, but, you know, I think this is this is one thing that uh, I'm, I'm not saying that these are things we don't know how to fix. I'm just saying these are like some possible sources. And so, like, if you think that this is the problem you have, reweighting is definitely the way to go. Okay, 
Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm trying to draw a distinction between data imbalance and data scarcity, uh, which are often sort of conflated in the literature. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Jamie, I think that oh, yep. in many important in many interesting cases, you don't really know that relationship. Yep. For sure, for sure, right? Uh, and that's sort of, you know, if you happen to know what alpha and alpha hat are, uh, then and and you know which samples were drawn from which distributions, then you can then you can reweight. But um, as you suggest, right, there are lots of cases where you maybe don't know whether the sampling distribution and the test distribution are equal, or maybe you know that um, you know that alpha and alpha hat are not equal. Uh, but for example, you don't observe class membership, right? You don't observe whether someone is male or female. You don't observe uh, race in some cases, or you're, you know, maybe legally restricted from from using that information in your training pipeline. So, so that's that's a great solution when it's possible, <laughs> um, but it's not always possible, both for information theoretic and for you know legal or other reasons. Um, if you don't have data from your test set, how would you even estimate alpha hat? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you certainly need to know something about your test distribution to do some reweighting or to estimate alpha hat to, to implement what Adam suggested. Awesome. Okay. So I want to draw, you know, just make this uh, crystal clear. Uh, the data imbalance and data scarcity are, are different phenomena. Uh, and when I say data scarcity, I just simply mean that you know, if you're in a regime where you have many fewer samples from one distribution than the other, right, uh, then the sort of the confidence intervals you can design around any predictions you're going to make are going to be wider for the population that you have less information about, right? Um, and this can occur even if sort of your sampling distribution is correct. Right, correct in the sense that training and test distributions match, right? But you might just have much less information about a population which is small. Um, and the way we ought to address data scarcity and data imbalance, uh, those should be quite different. Okay. So, uh, you know, a, a sort of guiding principle that I think everyone should focus on when thinking about a machine learning system that, that makes predictions uh, about people is how to identify and address these sources. Um, and I'm going to draw uh, a couple of distinctions between sort of tasks that live in uh, sort of really different spaces in my perspective uh, in terms of whether they are uh, basically whether data scarcity governs them or uh, data imbalance governs uh, governs governs what you might want to do. Uh, so the first question I think is always worth asking yourself is whether the learning task you're considering is collaborative or not. And by that I mean, is there a way to use training data from uh, one of the populations to help reducing your error on the other population? Um, so this is largely only going to be true, at least like in a strict sense, right? Uh, that training data from distribution D2 strictly improves your error on distribution D1 in the setting where you have not very much data about D1, right? Um, but this is still a very useful thing to ask yourself, right? When you're trying to decide, uh, okay, I'm doing some machine learning uh, to try to predict something, and I have two different populations. Um, is it the case that my second population is sort of helping me drive down the error on, for example, the smaller population? Okay. Um, so I want to pause here and ask people to think about uh, some other things beyond you know, what, other, what other properties of a problem might uh, cause uh, a learning task to be collaborative or not? Uh, does anybody have any thoughts here? Uh, you need some kind of structure that is common. So like 
if you're doing some face reconstruction, like the structure of the face is usually usually share some properties or like yeah salary will always be useful for loans yeah well, there's a question but uh <laughs> yeah so so uh certainly right uh the the relationship between the distributions you want to do is going to matter right and probably the marginal distribution um you know, if we think about d1 uh you know, y conditioned on x, uh, uh, basically d2 and d1's relationship between y and x, right? Uh, if, if we know that basically y conditioned on x is the same between d1 and d2, that's probably one case in which we would expect uh, to get some benefit from getting samples from, from d2, right? Um, if basically we want to make really different predictions for a particular x, if we knew that an individual was from D1 versus D2, that might suggest that this is going to be a problem which is more challenging uh, to argue that it is collaborative. Maybe one thing that complements it is, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, maybe one other thing that could complement that is whether what you're observing in both for both population captured the same thing. So, you know, you're measuring something that means to capture, um, you know, the same stuff, but it, in, in some cases we know that uh, that may not be the case. So you're using yeah. the same weight, you know, you measure SAT, but it means scores, but it means one thing for one population actually reflects something else for another population. Definitely, right? So that that is uh, something that's related to something. Hopefully, I'll have a, a few minutes to talk about uh, towards the end of the talk. But definitely, right? So so um, the both the distribution over the features we observe, um, you know, if they're if they're very similar for the two different populations, um, and they have sort of the same uh, marginal distribution that they represent over y. Uh, again, that's going to be going to be helpful. Whereas, you know, if basically knowing a FICO score or an SAT score of a given individual, if sort of the consequences of that information and what you'd ideally like to do with that information would be very different, uh, depending upon whether uh, you have that demographic information or not, right? Uh, that's certainly going to affect how collaborative the learning task will be. Other thoughts about things that might exist here? I'll add one. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if that happened. There we go. Uh, so, So the previous two uh, things that we wrote in this blue box were suggesting, you know, something about the distribution over features and possibly uh, the correlation between those features uh, and the prediction task were actually, you know, the, the target that we're, we're aiming for, right? Um, yet another thing that will affect whether or not a learning task is collaborative is sort of the complexity of the model we're allowing, right? Uh, and sort of how realizable this learning task is for the two different groups. Um, and by that, I just mean, you know, if we're using a linear model uh, and the linear model has high enough capacity to sort of do a similarly good job predicting on both populations simultaneously, right? That would suggest that this learning task might be somewhat more collaborative than in the setting where you know, basically you're forced to choose um, to, you know, whether you're forced to choose to uh, basically do a good job predicting for one population versus another. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more to say on that one as well. Um, but uh, I want to pause for a moment and ask if anybody else has any other thoughts or questions uh, sort of about, uh, you know, context in which learning tasks 
uh, for one population might benefit from data from another population. Um, you also need your sampling process to be similar in some way. So like, for instance, if you take the SID uh, again, the um, like what it's uh, what it's measured, like the people who pass some kind of threshold are not gonna be the same. Like if one sampling method is very useful for D2, it's not gonna be the same for D1. Yeah, so the sampling and measurement procedures of the two different populations, right? If they're, if they're very different, right? Uh, that's going to make it harder to learn uh, from one population about the other. Great. Okay. Uh, and while these are not exactly uh, sort of at odds with one another, I want to contrast this with uh, a, a somewhat related question about whether the learning task you're considering is rather than, you know, it could be both collaborative and competitive, but I'm going to uh, ask about competitiveness of a learning task. Um, so is it the case, uh, you know, and when will it be the case that training on the mixture D might lead to higher error on D1 uh, compared to training on data from D1 by itself? Uh, and, you know, this is obviously going to depend upon the relationship between uh, the distribution D and D1. Um, but there are other factors which are also going to govern whether a task is competitive, right? Uh, and I've sort of suggested a couple as we were talking through the other, the other uh, slide on cooperation. But does anybody have any thoughts here about uh, things that might make a task competitive or not? And I also want to mention, while while people are thinking about that, uh, that you know whether a learning task is competitive or not is certainly going to depend on how you use uh, the data from your mixture, right? You can certainly ignore that data, right? Uh, and if you ignore the data from from D two, right, uh, it shouldn't that that should be fine, right? In the sense that that shouldn't harm your error on D one compared to not having that data at all. Um, uh, how do you know that you can ignore D2? I mean, you have to know yeah, that again, it's coming from D2. Agreed. You can't necessarily do that if you don't have the information. Right? Um, I, yeah. uh, if you know that there is some noise that is specific to uh, only one distribution, like the quality of a candidate is always done sampled on one. Uh, yeah noise models being very different. Right. And that could both be in terms of uh, the noise in our target Y or you know measurement errors in X. I said this on the previous slide and this is important here too, so I'll go ahead and say it. Uh, again, this is going to uh, depend on sort of the capacity of our model, right? If we can basically find a model which does optimally for both groups simultaneously, right? Uh, then this is essentially uh, a problem where, um, you know, where data from the second population shouldn't hurt, it shouldn't hurt our ability to optimize on the first population. So model capacity or realizability. Okay, uh, so I also just want to briefly mention um, that whether your learning task is competitive or not uh, is very related to whether <laughs> you're forcing yourself to use a single model for elements from population one versus individuals from population two, right? Uh, and there are some contexts in which, again, that's maybe required or 
uh, you just don't know which which elements, uh, which which samples came from population one versus population two, either in training or in test. Um, so there are definitely contexts in which uh, you can't just train separate models for D1 and D2. Um, uh, but you know, if you could, right? Um, if you had that information both in training and test, and you were allowed to sort of do arbitrarily different things on two different populations, um, that will sort of remove the competitive nature uh, of a learning task. Uh, and this is quite related to um, something that was actually observed, I think it was 2016, maybe 2017, um, that uh, work Emilika and Kalai observed, which they referred to as the cost of coupling, which is this idea that if you're forced to use a single model that doesn't directly um, look at membership or you know, whether, whether a sample was sampled from D1 versus D2, um, that can make sort of, that can sort of force you to choose between optimizing for error on population one versus population two. Okay, so uh, I wanna talk a bit about uh, a couple of different collaborative regimes uh, and a couple of observations uh, that some of, uh, that some colleagues and I have, have had. Um, and you know, this is this is far from a complete story, right? These are just um, some observations about some things that can happen when you're working on collaborative learning tasks. Uh, and I probably won't have time to talk much about uh, sort of the competitive regime, but I do have some, some thoughts there as well. Okay, so the first project I want to just say, you know, five minutes worth of stuff about uh, is, is thinking about when and how we might be able to use data about a lot larger population to help drive down error for a smaller population. Okay? Uh, and so we'll introduce a fairly stylized model, uh, allied lots of the details, but say a little bit about, about something there. Uh, and that work is joint with a bunch of excellent people, uh, uh, Anker, Freddie, and Satan are at MIT and Morris is at Berkeley. Uh, the Freddie, Satan, and Morris are all excellent students. Freddie and Satan are uh, on the market right now. So, uh, you know, uh, advertisement here for them. <laughs> um, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, a, a different project, which tries to understand sort of when collaboration might uh, disappear uh, in a setting where you wouldn't necessarily expect um, and by that, I mean, you know, you might be operating uh, in some, you know, doing some kind of learning that is collaborative between two different populations. Uh, and then add a constraint or, you know, add some bells and whistles on top that don't seem like they should have anything to do with uh, whether a task is collaborative or not. Um, but they might break the collaborative structure that you had without that constraint. Um, so, you know, that's a that's a fairly different topic, right? But it's it's worth thinking about. You know, just because you have a collaborative learning task doesn't mean that you can sort of do arbitrary things to it, even if those things don't seem like they should affect uh, sort of the performance on different populations differently. Uh, you can break collaborative structure when doing things like that. Okay, and as I mentioned, um, I'm not really going to have time to talk about uh, competitive regimes, right? Oh, and this is the wrong set of authors anyway. Right. Um, but in competitive regimes, right, in settings where sort of you're forced to choose between uh, reducing accuracy, uh, or sorry, improving accuracy in one population versus another, um, that's like a pretty different scenario in which you'll want to think about different tools, techniques. Um, and I do have some thoughts there, but uh, probably won't have time to talk about those today. Okay. So, uh, let's think about when it's possible to use data about a larger population to help a smaller one. Okay. Uh, and to drill down on that somewhat, uh, somewhat, um, I think it's useful to think about the following question. When is it possible to provably, right, in like a formal sense, improve upon uh, the accuracy uh, for a minority population compared to both of the following? So the first one is you might imagine that you train a model on only the minority population, right? And hopefully 
uh, you know, in a in a strictly collaborative framework, we should be able to argue that we can we can use data from the majority to strictly improve upon the accuracy for the minority compared to just using minority data. Um, and we might also hope that there is a regime where that you can both improve upon sort of the minority only model and also do better than just using the majority model for the minority population. Right. Um, so this is sort of a, a space in which um, you know you don't have enough data about the minority to minimize uh, to minimize your error on the minority uh, just using that data. Um, but also there is some difference between the distribution of the majority and the minority uh, that sort of says, you know, it's actually useful to have some data about the minority uh, to improve upon the accuracy you get just from using the majority model. Uh, so the first uh, thing where, you know, if you want to do better than just training on the minority alone, right? Uh, that will usually be possible only when you have a pretty small amount of data about the minority, or at least less data about the minority than the majority. Uh, and, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, it will only be possible to beat the majority model's performance on the minority uh, if there's some difference in the distribution between the majority and the minority. So, you know, in a one slide takeaway from, from this collaboration, um, in the context of measuring errors of different sizes, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute, um, and, you know, a setting where uh, there's an optimal model, if we didn't have measurement errors, that minimizes error simultaneously for both populations. Um, in some high dimensional cases, it'll be possible to use majority data to learn and mitigate minority measurements in a provable sense. So what I mean by that is, uh, let's, let's start by talking about what I mean when I say measurements. So let's imagine uh, that there's a linear model which governs the relationship between x, hat, and y for both populations. Okay. But let's say we don't observe that exactly, right? Suppose, you know, but instead we observe uh, pairs x, y, where each feature x, i is perturbed, right? So there's some true linear relationship between x hat and y, but we observe x's which have sort of coordinate y's independent noise added to them, right? Um, this is what I mean by a measurement error, right? Basically, the way, uh, for example, SAT scores or FICO scores or height and weight are measured have different distributions over errors for our two different populations. Right? Um, if that is the case, right, that all of these measurements are, are imperfect and they're imperfect in sort of different ways for our two different populations, there are going to be contexts in which we can use majority data to learn about the size of the measurement errors we might observe on, a, on the minority population and use that to do a better job predicting for the minority by uh, then using the minority data. Do people have any questions about this slide? I know I haven't been like particularly formal about what I mean here, but uh, yeah, happy to take any questions here. So uh, largely the, the perspective that informed this work uh, is the idea that you know, many of the ways we measure things for, for, for humans uh, is prone to, are prone to lots of different measurement errors. And we, we do have you know, a reasonable amount of evidence that suggests those measurement errors are not equally distributed for different populations. So if you're in a regime where you really have a lot less data about one population than another, and you have reason to believe that you might have measurement errors that are differently distributed, uh, there are some interesting algorithmic and statistical techniques you can use uh, to mitigate some of the differences in accuracy you might, you might see for your two different populations. Uh, and you know, I, I sort of at the bottom of the slide called this fair transfer, right? Uh, 
the idea here is basically, you know, to transfer something you learn about the majority uh, to inform the way you're predicting on the minority. Okay. So the other thing I wanted to say a couple of words about uh, is, is this recent project uh, joint with Se Wong Oh, uh, another IFML senior personnel uh, member, uh, which aimed to understand, uh, and, and Josh Gardner, who's an excellent PhD student here uh, at UW, uh, is to understand when sort of constraints on top of a collaborative learning task can actually harm uh, the collaborative effect uh, of that learning task. Okay. And I want to uh, sort of start <laughs> briefly by uh, giving some small observation, which I think is, is useful and has been informing some of the questions I've been thinking about recently, um, which is the following. Um, also, apologies, my dog is whining in the background. <laughs> uh, it, it appears that lots and lots of tasks uh, seem to be pretty uh, pretty collaborative. And when I say easily collaborative, I mean, you know, just doing sort of the brain dead thing of training on a data set, which is the union of the majority and the minority, not doing any reweighting, not doing anything fancy, uh, just trying to minimize loss on the union of two data sets or on the data set that contains members both from the majority and minority, improves on the accuracy for the minority. Um, and, you know, that's somewhat surprising, especially, uh, I mean, I guess it, it depends on what you're thinking about, but uh, lots of sort of practical large scale machine learning systems seem to operate in this way. Uh, and, you know, if you're in a, if you're in a world where many of the tasks you're thinking about um, seem to be collaborative, that seems like a, a good reason to think more carefully about, about collaborative learning tasks. Um, so the, the regimes in which we observed this were, you know, lots and lots of facial uh, facial analysis kinds of tasks, right? Um, you know, be they facial recognition or sort of categorization of individuals. You know, if you're trying to determine whether individuals are smiling or not, uh, or you know, something about their hair color or whether or not they're wearing a head covering, right? All of these sorts of tasks. Um, we we ran a bunch of different experiments. Uh, that suggested that basically smaller populations seem to have better accuracy or, or seem to suffer lower loss uh, when training was done on a data set that included lots of individuals, not just from that smaller population. Um, and so that's that's somewhat interesting. <laughs> and one of the reasons, you know, probably the primary reason this is the case uh, is a combination between um, you know, using really high dimensional models, which basically have, have the capacity to essentially memorize the data set, right, and really drive down uh, training error to nearly zero. Um, and also because, uh, and also because there's sort of limited amounts of data about the minority. Uh, so basically additional amounts of data really, really seem to improve even for those populations, because the learning task is somehow sufficiently similar for the two different populations. Um, so with that observation, right, uh, we aim to try to understand another thing which has been observed empirically, uh, I'll stay on this slide for a moment, uh, which is that there have been observations that adding differential privacy uh, as, as a constraint uh, seems to impact smaller populations more and often more so than sort of the standard generalization costs that you get from belonging to a smaller population. Right? So I'm not going to spend the time to, to formally define differential privacy, right? but uh, it's a constraint you might want to satisfy for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, and it mitigates the extent to which uh, your learning procedure uh, divulges any too much information about any individual data point in your training set. Um, so that doesn't seem a priori like it should have anything to do with uh, sort of uh, group specific performance. Um, but there's been some observations empirically that have shown um, that differential privacy can come at a bigger cost for, for smaller populations. Um, so we tried to understand sort of when we can sort of uh, 
we could reconcile these two pieces of information simultaneously. Lots of tasks appear to be collaborative uh, in sort of high dimensional regimes, uh, you know, using large neural networks for certain kinds of prediction tasks. Um, but that adding differential privacy on top seems to break that uh, easy correlative structure. So, uh, you know, in the in the theme of sort of coming up with highly stylized models that uh, seem to give some intuition as to why this might be occurring, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, one of the observations we had here. Um, so if you imagine using, for example, stochastic gradient descent, right, to train a linear model over one of these mixture distributions, right, uh, that might be one way you do this in a dimensional setting, right? If both distributions, right, uh, both D1 and D2 have the same re linear relationship between X and Y, um, but maybe have different distributions over the features X, right? Um, then there's a nice way you can sort of describe precisely what the what the additional loss you'd expect to see from that model would be. Um, not important that you parse this, right? But for, for people who enjoy, uh, you know, math for show towards the end of us uh, talk, here you go. Um, just as a corollary of existing work, right? You can sort of draw out something about uh, the population specific error would be by using SGD on sort of the mixture of distributions, right? Um, and, you know, one thing to observe this first term, you can think of as sort of the bias term uh, of this learning procedure. Um, and it depends on the rate at which individuals are sampled from different populations, this should be I. Right. So the loss you'll get for population I, right, will have both a bias and a variance term. And the bias term uh, is higher when you have uh, when you have less data about a population. Somewhat unsurprisingly. Right? Um, but this doesn't necessarily uh, violate anything we've talked about so far. Um, you'll also notice that so. Um, T here is something that's a function of both uh, the size of the data set for the majority and the minority. Um, so you get some benefit from using data from both populations. And this is just using vanilla stochastic gradient descent, nothing fancy here. Um, on the other hand, if you basically swap in a differentially private version of stochastic gradient descent, um, you get a sort of different bound, right? Uh, so the only two things that have changed on this slide were that we added differential privacy and this variance term changes a little bit, right? Uh, and the upshot of both of these things, uh, which you may or may not be able to parse from the slide, uh, is something similar, is something simple, right? Depending upon what uh, the covariance matrices look like for these different populations, and depending on the relative size of the different populations, you can live in a world where if you belong to the smaller population, uh, it is to your advantage to have the majority's population uh, in the training procedure with you if you're just looking at stochastic gradient descent. But if you know that the algorithm is going to guarantee differential privacy, you suddenly would rather be trained without the majority data. And at least from my perspective, this is somewhat surprising. Uh, yeah, Jamie, I didn't. I had I had trouble sort of parsing that. I mean, um, yeah. Is, is is this an issue with the stochastic gradient descent versus gradient descent, or is, is this the noise that you're adding? No. Or? No, so it's, it's a function of, of the noise you're adding uh, and that noise sort of having bigger impact on the on the smaller population. But it's not necessarily smaller population. It also has to do with sort of the distribution over the features you see. Um, I mean, not could, could, you go, could you go back to the previous slide and just uh, roughly uh, remind me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so I think the the the, ter the term that's worth thinking about is this one. Right, so this is the variance term. Um, so the first term, I, the first term I can always drive to drive down. I mean, I forget what gamma is here. Is that's some yeah, gamma. Gamma is the step size. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, think about the first term as being relatively low order, right? 
uh, t is the number of rounds we're going to average or iterate over. So like the first term goes to zero much more quickly with t than the second one. Um, so so the second one is maybe the more the more enlightening elucidating one, right? Uh, and basically, this additional term right here, right, um, where we have an additional amount of variance uh, that the different populations suffer, or rather, basically adding differential privacy adds to the variance uh, of the model we, we learn. And the way that error propagates for the different populations will be different. Right? Um, where HI here is the covariance matrix for population I. Okay, but I thought we only had two populations here. Yeah, we do. I'm just saying I is in the set one, two. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. So L sub I is, that's, L sub I is the loss of, oh, mm -hmm. I see, okay, I see, okay. Yep. okay. Yep, yep. So a quick yeah. question. Uh, where is the noise being added here? Is it, uh, is the noise added to the gradients, to the cost function? Yeah. How is yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. here? Absolutely. So, so uh, you know, I've, I've ignored where this is coming, but let's imagine that what we're doing is we're adding noise to the gradient at every step, right, to, to satisfy differential privacy. Mm -hmm. and, and let's imagine that there's no clipping or any of these other things which add to the complexity uh, of, of analyzing such an algorithm, but, you know, you can still satisfy differential privacy assuming that, you know, all of your original things were, were bounded, for example, right? Yeah. All of your X's. What is the data that you're protecting here? Like in particular, what is the adjacency relationship uh, here? Uh, like the, the training yeah. data set? Yeah, on the training data. Training data set, okay. Yeah. yeah. So the, the upshot here is that this variance term will behave pretty differently for certain different populations, right? Um, that basically the this differential privacy term uh, will will really affect the variance of the two different populations. Differently. So even if you were in a world where stochastic gradient descent uh, helped, you know, on on the union of two different populations helped both populations simultaneously, which is what we've observed. Uh, in practice for a bunch of these larger scale models, uh, just adding somewhat innocuous uh, noise to your gradients at every step can harm the minority more than the majority. And, and in fact, can lead the minority to prefer being having, having uh, their model trained only on the minority's data. So a question that I have, a follow-up question, could it be because the differential privacy is not implemented uh, properly here? Because for a larger population, chances are that you need a less uh, level of variance uh, to protect uh, the training data set of the larger population, whereas for a smaller one, you need, uh, uh, you need more uh, noise. And when you're treating them uh, equally, uh, then uh, you're, doing, uh, you're not treating them fairly. So, so uh, this goes back to the question you asked a minute ago, this adjacency question, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, the short answer is, uh, I believe in this case, we are, we are satisfying uh, differential privacy, assuming that an arbitrary data point can be replaced with an arbitrary other data point, right? Uh, and, and I'm not aware of a way to define differential privacy that sort of allows us to only define adjacency within groups uh, that doesn't have some pretty uh, subtle technical problem. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um so 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 you know yes if you basically know one population is way bigger than the other and you only allow yourself to define adjacency with like population specific replacements maybe you can get away with something different here but even so i'm not sure that this particular source would go away i see yeah right and in fact it might get worse right because uh you have to add more noise to the smaller population <laughs> uh, yeah. if, if that's exactly. Jamie, I hate to, hate to interrupt you, but we are running out of time here. Yep, absolutely. Um,
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Uh, so uh, I think it's, you know, at a, at a high level, I think these questions are not sort of brought to the fore as much as they ought to be, but uh, I think it's really useful to think about whether a learning task that you care about disparate performance uh, within is collaborative or competitive. Uh, and that's often a somewhat subtle question uh, and sort of what the source of your unequal error is. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate the interactions.